22nd of December, 1924. Two days later,
Hi, guy. Hey, you. <laughs> Hi, guy. Hi, guy. Hi, guy.
crew muster for the three master flying Dutchmen. Turn to free booting December 25 of the year of our Lord 1724. None may know the name Jeremiah Johnson Tecker, but all fear Shorty Leg. Born in Cork, he was 14 years old when he freed himself from the shark's manacles, turned two cannons loaded with grape shot at the captain's cabin, and fired. The recoil whipped off one of his legs. In 1717, he was found and brought aboard the Jolly Roger by One-Eyed Jack, after drifting for two weeks on a makeshift raft. Using a steel cooking pot in the sun's rays, he had taken the salt from the seawater, thus having water to drink. Fish he did knock on the head with his peg leg. Thereafter... It became his weapon of choice. Taken on as ship's surgeon. Morning, sir.
morning. Hey, you. Whoa. Life and times of the freebooters and buccaneers.
My iron fist will lead you till it freezes in hell. Cheers rang out at this promise. Hanging by the foot from a spar, the one-armed man begged for mercy. One-eyed Jack looked up at him with his good eye and said, May the sun cure your flesh and tan your stinking hide, you poxy cur! Black Hat stood ready. The shark's fin glided close by. No, not that, yelped the one-armed sea dog. Black Hat threw his hat and it cut the rope. The one-armed man did not swim long. Hurrah for the captain, roared the shipmates. Caramba, that seems a little harsh, muttered Luis. The new cook, T-Bone, glared. Maybe you want to swim too, eh? he growled. No, senor, I beg you, I say nothing. Then shut your gob and do as you're told. Three knocks if you want to enter the captain's cabin. And forget one arm. His cooking was only fit for swine. Master for the three master flying Dutchmen. Turn to freebooting December 25 of the year of our Lord 1724. My music is a requiem. Sean O'Leary from Dublin dreamed of becoming a harpsichordist, but was hounded from the country after throwing three guests through a window for having suggested that his Vivaldi was perhaps slightly fast. He joined the Third Highlanders and lost a hand at the Siege of Gibraltar. He deserted and studied the accordion under Sancho Fernandez, the mad armorer. Hiding out in the Leeward Islands, he did many lowly jobs. He was almost lynched during the Red Night and sought refuge with one-eyed Jack. He became one of his lieutenants after the Chow Bang Massacre. October 1712. Musician.
With Q in hand, by the Honorable Senator Grant. As soon as I could, between two sessions, I would practice my skill with the two bands. I managed some splendid shots, but I was far from attaining my dream of potting three balls at the same time. The legendary shot. I leave that to the expert players of Mandarin, the game of Chinese billiards, at which I have never been more than a bumbler. I have enough trouble shooting two consecutive doubles, as I did during a very long game with Elisha Comstock. Yet I did see a ruffian by the name of DeWitt accomplish what I had thought was impossible. The fellow actually managed two triples before my eyes. From then on, I practiced feverishly, even renouncing <clears throat> alcohol and wine, which poisons the spirit sentries. Seven days later, the powdered rascal took three hundred dollars from me. I was so furious that I later refused to preside over the defense commission. With my gold in his pocket, he sneered at me. Senator, you would need many lives to beat me. I intended to challenge him to another match, but DeWitt disappeared completely. I was sickened. So downhearted was I that I gave up the game for three years, turning instead to casino gambling. My experiences in that field are described in my last book, The Jackpot I Nearly Won.
Do you know that wine may open many a door?
crew muster for the three master flying Dutchmen. Turn to freebooting December 25 of the year of our Lord, 1724. Son of a baron and born of a chambermaid, Frederick de Witt was brought up strictly. At the death of his tutor, he was free to study the alchemistic art. Clever with his fingers, he spent much time at the gaming table, ruining Redmond Barry at the game of piquet. An adventure with the Countess of O forced him to join the navy. <laughs> he soon deserted his ship. His skill with cards gained him a reputation in Barbados where he met One-Eyed Jack. Their one and only game resulted in the massacre of Terra Nova. A friendship was born. DeWitt served Jack as both spy and poisoner, and served well. The Princess Isabelita Negroni called him the brightest star of my nights. Joined in 1715 as pharmacist, Mr. I may have another name. Who knows? Born at New Amgar and transported to Haiti, his life was chaos until he met Elizabeth Jarrett. Initiated into voodoo, he became the Hunsi for the new priestess after losing his senses for fourteen days and nights. His remarkable eyesight earned him the post of lookout following the attack of 25 December. Accompanied by his mates, the Look Boys, he likes to dance for the crew on calm days. In fighting, his way with a harpoon is fearful to behold. The pillage of San Cristobal and the sacking of the governor's palace were examples of his thirst for killing. Who can have forgotten how he harpooned the rector, Joaro de la Cruz, from thirty feet? Joined as lookout on 25 December, 1724. Ask me to name a man among men and I'll say Black Hat. A bright lad, Alistair Fane began his life of crime at the age of eight. To free his father, he placed a toy bear stuffed with dynamite at the gates of Killarney Jail. Nine men died! Soft-hearted to a fault, he kept Captain Dixon's black hat and stitched blades into its rim. He then stowed away and ended up in Trinidad, where he took an interest in firearms and became an expert man-hunter. One-Eyed Jack was sure to learn of such a man. Black Hat. Marksman. Bubble Blade is the youngest of a family of armorers of Toledo. Trained from birth to handle a sword, he became a duelist of note. At the Prado, he gutted the young viceroy. His famous escape from Santa Sangre is still spoken of in awe. One-Eyed Jack recruited him in Mexico, persuading him to say farewell to his six magnificent companions in arms. Tales of his famous secret stroke, the Royal Pardon, soon spread far and wide. His two-hour fight with Lieutenant Briggs will go down in the history of freebooting. Bubble Blade, Second Lieutenant.
Chess and Magic. If the White Queen seeks the throne, the king must empower her. May the amulet laid in the center of the sign open the doorway to space. That is the key to the royal gambit. Translator's note. This Gaelic poem might have helped Crowley to defeat Tartakover, the man who fed the devil in the box with gold.
Dear Mr. Jack, sorry, stop. We have no more red balls for the tree, stop. Hope you got the case of champagne. Again, sorry, stop. Hector Coward, Xmas Acme Limited. By the horn of Beelzebub, the flying Dutchman was calling me. It was like honey to a bee. The enemy wanted to put an end to it. Its cannons spouted death. No matter. My ship was sinking, but my praise bridge flowed with blood. On this Xmas Eve of 1724, the cries of pain filled the air like the most glorious of hymns. The captain, one Nichols, told me to go to the devil.
He died cursing me. You will die by my sword, Jack! Ha <laughs> ha! His sword remained stuck on the deck of his ship, the Flying Dutchman. My lieutenants greedily burst the locks of the hold. The crew seemed disappointed with the loot, but I knew we had taken the finest of all treasures. And in Elizabeth's eyes, I could read our destiny. And death became an illusion. I signed the pact, and so did my men. The Dutchman was ours. From then on, thousands of legends were being told about the Flying Dutchman. We hid here in 1824, but the cliff collapsed on our ship. And so our land flowed with blood. And we named our conquest Hell's Kitchen. A land with no past offered itself to us to guarantee our future. We built our mansion, and since then, we reign undisputedly! <laughs> Dear Mr. Jack, sorry, stop. We have no more red balls for the tree, stop. Hope you got the case of champagne. Again, sorry, stop. Hector Coward, Xmas Acme Limited.
More than two centuries ago, Elizabeth Jarrett arrived in Haiti. I was then an innocent young girl, but Cotton, my tutor, taught me contempt. In hiding, a slave of his taught me to ride the shadows. Soon, the slave grew stronger than the master. Cotton felt the extent of my revenge and became my creature. The soldiers took us prisoner, but could they recognize Cotton? From then on, the Flying Dutchman was my jail. I could see the desk where the captain hid the duplicate to the iron's key. My spirit wandered. One eye Jack heard my call for help. My soul guided him. And death is my ally. <laughs> he and his crew would become immortal. And every one hundred years. An innocent girl would turn old for us. <laughs> A gust of freedom freshened my jail. <laughs> Rock! If it is the staff you're looking for, it has been hidden! What a bore! Rock! In the cavern of the one-eyed man? That's where you should seek it! If you can! Rock! If you please, do not sneeze! Rock!
Hey, you. Hey, you.
I overcame voodoo, an unpublished chapter of manuscript found in a bottle. In the heart of the storm, the Malay suddenly emerged from the cabin, waving a chicken leg. The possessed one would have given his soul for chalk. Captain Pregg's orders rang out about the howling of the tempest. Do as he says. A monstrous wave had taken Giovanno, the cabin boy. Another terrifying wall of water loomed to starboard, demanding its due. The Malay grabbed the chalk as if it were a diamond-studded crown. Upon the deck he drew a strange pattern. Papa Legba screamed the demented savage, waving his chicken leg. The effect was prodigious. The wave stopped where it was, twixt heaven and hell. He then searched inside the leather pouch that he had hanging round his neck and took out a piece of mirror. He placed it in the center of the altar that stood beneath the mizzen mast and on which he had drawn a vive. Drawing from his red belt the strange staff which he always carried, the Malay shook it at the wave and chanted. The giant wave sank gently into the ocean. Voodoo! Voodoo! yelled our savior as Giovanno's body struck the vessel's hull. I can bring him back. The Malay looked over at Prext, who answered, No, the fool could not even read.
powder plot. Relating the mutiny which was declared in 1769 on board HMS Dark Horse, in Danny Boy, being small of size, was able to pass alongside the salting tub. Clutching a poker, he slipped into the powder room where Captain Jenkins, his officers, and what crewmen remained loyal to king and country were all gathered. Jenkins was rallying his men with a spirited rendition of Rule Britannia. Danny stuck the few fuse in the keg of powder during the first verse. He let out the string. No sooner had he lit the end of the fuse with a piece of incandescent metal when the ship was buffeted by a large wave. A poorly stowed barrel slid from its mooring and blocked the way out. The fuse burned on. The men still sang, except for the troublemaker, who stood petrified in terror. Never, never, never shall be slaves, still echoed in the air when the dark horse blew up. Several of the survivors claimed that Danny Boy had tried to extinguish the fuse by spitting on it. If only provisions of sand had been made ready for such emergencies. <laughs> From that time on, the stower's name was cursed by all freebooters. And so ended in flame and death the tragic tale of a fine freemaster, now resting eighty feet under the waves of the balmy Indian Ocean.
Ha 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 ha! 